They say the hardest thing for a Jew to do is to embrace Jesus as his or her Messiah. That's understandable. For nearly 2,000 years, Jews have been persecuted, often by those claiming to be followers of Jesus. Since the first followers of Jesus were all Jews, the resentment has a long and tragic history. It stands to reason that if it is difficult for a Jew to embrace Jesus, it's even more difficult for a rabbi to do so. And that begs the question of how difficult it would be for the most revered rabbi in all of Israel to proclaim that the name of the Messiah is Yehoshua, the Hebrew version of Jesus. came out of what's now, of course, modern-day Iraq. Uh, that's where he was raised as a young man. When he was 13 or 16, different accounts have a different age, but between 13 and 16, there was a rabbi, very popular in the area in which he lived, who pronounced a, a prophecy over this young boy who was already showing great interest in the study of Jewish scriptures and the mystical aspects of Kabbalah, very popular among certain sects of Jews. Uh, he was already displaying great affinity towards that study and, 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 and gifts in those areas. And this, this uh, rabbi from Iraq, uh, venerated in his day, uh, pronounced over this young boy that he would be used of God, he would be great, that, that people would flock to his doors in the future seeking blessings, and that before his life was over, he would see the Messiah. Now that was a pretty profound prophecy and it, and it profoundly affected young uh, Kaduri. Well, he eventually migrated as a young man and uh, as a young married man uh, into uh, the area that we now know as Israel, but Kaduri was born in the late 1800s, so his life spanned a portion of the 1800s, all of the 1900s, and then he uh, passed in 2006, so the beginning of the 2000s. In the early um, 1900s, he migrated to uh, Israel uh, before it was even a nation. So uh, he, he saw every major war. I mean, he lived through World War I and through World War II, and then, of course, the, the, the founding of Israel, and then all of the wars that ensued uh, in Israel's independence and fighting for its independence. Uh, he, he, he went through all of that. Great figures in, in, in Israel's history came and went. Great figures in world history came and went through his lifetime. And so after Israel was founded, though, as a nation, uh, he still was, was quite a humble and uh, relatively unknown, kind of an obscure figure. He was serving in a yeshiva, which would be roughly equivalent to, to, to a seminary, a, a training school uh, for, for uh, young Jews who were interested in, and, uh, in, in the deeper meanings and the mysterious meanings of the scripture. And, and uh, he, he was training these students and he was uh, binding books and uh, producing amulets, little little blessings, uh, little necklace and bracelet blessings that he would give to people and, and uh, down through the years as he aged and uh, the passing of other rabbis, eventually the mantle was passed on to him and uh, he became known as the one to go to for a blessing, the one to go to for some counsel, the one to go to for illumination upon the scriptures and, and made quite a reputation very humbly and very quietly, uh, known overall as a very meek man. Not, not loud, obnoxious or outspoken, but uh, uh, before long, uh, many were claiming that his blessings were working and his blessings were having profound effect on people's lives. Everything from people claiming that his blessings allowed them to produce children where they were not able to do so, uh, or to get a job where they couldn't have, or to produce riches where they were not. Um, and so word got around that this was the man to go to. One of the amazing things about Kaduri is that he was said to have this uh, uh, fantastic photographic memory and a, and a mind that was just a, just a trap of information and that people would bring a book 
for him to bind and how much will you charge me? Well, I won't charge you anything if you'll allow me to, uh, to read it, to keep it for a while. And then he was uh, reported to have read just volumes and volumes of books and studied them. And then the claim was is that he would memorize them. I, I know for most of us that sounds incredulous, but, but often he was tested in that. People would ask him a question from a certain piece of literature. Not only would he give the answer, but often he would quote directly from the book. And then he would sometimes give the, the chapter or the page number whereupon that quote was found and people were quite astounded that his mind uh, was sharp and that he obviously did have a photographic memory. The three largest religions in the world uh, identified as monotheistic, and of course there is some debate about Islam whether it's truly monotheistic or not, but, but they identify themselves that way. So the three largest monotheistic religions in the world, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, all three of those religions are looking for and expecting a messiah. Interestingly, they are all interconnected in their looking for a messiah in various ways. The Christians, of course, uh, adhering to the New Testament documents as they are interpreted through the Old Testament documents, as all of that is interpreted through the proclamations of Jesus Christ and the revelations of Paul and the revelation of John. And, uh, they are looking for Jesus the Christ who was crucified on Calvary's cross, risen from the dead. They are looking for him to return as the ruling and reigning Messiah, as he promised, as the angelic uh, announcers promised, um, as the uh, New Testament prophets, again, Paul, John, the gospel writers, etc., as they all promised. So the Christian world is looking for the return of Jesus Christ as outlined in the New Testament documents. Now, interestingly, the, the uh, Muslim religion, Islam, they are also looking for a Messiah to come. They call him the, the Mahdi, M-A-H-D-I. Uh, but the reason I say interestingly is because they fully expect and teach that Jesus, whom they claim as a prophet of Islam, they do not claim that Jesus was the Son of God. They do not claim that he had any deity about him as the New Testament Christian scriptures would proclaim. But they proclaim that he was a prophet sent by Allah to the Jews uh, with the basic message that they must turn to Islam. So they, they believe that Jesus is a, a great prophet, not as great as Muhammad. Muhammad is the greatest. But they're, in their teaching, they teach that Jesus will return uh, just before or with the Mahdi, uh, the, the ruling and reigning Messiah to come. Now, a Christian would say, this is a, another Jesus, this is another gospel. I understand that, but I'm, I'm just saying that Islam attests to this historical person of Jesus. And they say that Christians have it all wrong, that he didn't come to be the Messiah, he came to be a prophet to the Jews. Judaism also is expecting their long-awaited Messiah. Now, those that are students of the New Testament understand that that was the furor of Jesus' day when people were proclaiming his, him as Messiah because the Jewish understanding of Messiah is a little different from the, from the conservative Christian understanding of Messiah. The Jewish people have longed for the Messiah for over 2,000 years, and especially since the destruction of the temple. They've longed for someone to deliver them, and the more calamity, the greater the longing. Yeshua, or Jesus, said that, you know, you, you don't receive me, you'll receive others. And the fact is, in Jewish history, since the time of Jesus, there have been about 40 ma major, in some way, false messiahs who have come who have been embraced in one form or another by rabbis and by segments of the Jewish people uh, there was actually a very famous figure Bar Kokhba who is a known as a hero in Jewish history but he was a false messiah he was he was hailed as a messiah and he led to he led the Jewish people to really destruction you had another very famous false messiah who was called Shabbat Zevi. And this was in the 17th century, and Jewish people all over Europe and rabbis hailed him as the messiah, and they expected him to bring peace. And the problem was he ended up being arrested by the Sultan uh, of Turkey, who gave him a choice to either convert to Islam or be killed, and so he converted. <laughs> 
Yet, according to the Bible, there, there are exact requirements of the Messiah. And again, only one fulfilled that. And according to Daniel, the Messiah had to come before, before the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So whoever the Messiah is, the Messiah of the Jewish people, the Jewish Messiah, he had to have come before the year 70 AD. And again, there's only one in human history who's even known around the world. Even his name means the Messiah. His first name, Yeshua, means salvation. Last name means Messiah, who, who uh, the entire world has centered on, our entire date system has divided over, and he just happens to be Jewish, and he just happened to have fulfilled all the prophecies of the dying Messiah of the Hebrew Scriptures, and that happens to be Yeshua, Jesus. So the Jews, even of Jesus' day, were, were feeling around the edges to see if he truly was the Messiah, but their understanding of Messiah has more to do with a nationalistic Messiah, a, a, a ruling and reigning king who would, who would uh, nationalize Israel and firm its, its strength and its borders and its foundations and, and, and establish it as the nation of God, the ruling and reigning nation of God from where God's throne is located. Many people uh, believe that that's why Judas got so bumfuzzled and wound up selling out Jesus and the disciples because he was fully expecting this this Jesus from Nazareth to be this this uh, this nationalistic figure. Uh, we see in the New Testament scriptures uh, uh, a couple of brothers, John and James, and, and the mother uh, that that wants to know, uh, you know, when you come into your kingdom, can my can my boys rule and reign at your at your right, one at your left, and one at your right? They thought that he was going to ascend some type of a throne, become the king of the Jews, if you will, the king of Israel, reestablish Israel, throw off their Roman shackles and the bondage of this huge Roman empire and become the mighty superpower of the world. And finally, this messianic nation that they had so longed for and so uh, long waited for. The Jews are expecting um, uh, two messiahs. This is a little confusing to a lot of uh, Christians, but uh, it's long been taught in Judaism that they are expecting Messiah ben Joseph. The word ben, of course, means son of. Messiah, son of Joseph, who is a more of a nationalistic figure, a, a, a great military leader, a great ruling kind of political figure. Messiah ben Joseph, very interestingly, Jewish tradition teaches that Messiah ben Joseph would eventually be um, uh, betrayed and rejected by his own people, that he would eventually be killed, and that when the second Messiah, Messiah uh, ben David, arrives, who is the ultimate Messiah, he would resurrect ben, uh, Messiah ben Joseph. He would cause him to be resurrected. Every time Jesus went to a hillside to teach, there were 10,000 people that would show up. Um, the man was popular, and, and, it, and he obviously had, uh, just humanly speaking, he obviously, to the people who lived in, had a touch of God, an anointing of God. So even when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said, look, we, we know that you must be sent by God at least because of the miracles you do, the things that you say. And many of the Jews were beginning to think because of his miracles, and some of the prophecies that he was fulfilling as they began to search the Old Testament scriptures, could this be the Messiah? Many began to call him son of David, a messianic term. Tens of thousands of people followed him, yeah, for the miracles and for the, for, for the, for the spectacle of it all, but many, many of them were beginning to believe that he could be the Messiah, so much so that in the last week of his life when he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, thus fulfilling some prophecies in Zechariah, they, 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 they hailed him as the son of David, the Messiah. The, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, went, went to Jesus said, tell your disciples and tell the crowd to, to stop this. This is blasphemous for them to be identifying this man as, as the Messiah. In Orthodox Judaism, the whole concept of Jesus of the New Testament, Jesus, what a Christian would call Jesus the Christ, the whole concept of the New Testament documents is anathema. The Orthodox Jew does not even recognize the, the historical Jesus, or, or if they do, they claim that Gentiles usurped uh, 
his authority and, and, and projected onto him this figure of messiahhood. That, and so Orthodox Jews teach their children, have nothing to do with this Christianity stuff, have nothing to do with the New Testament documents, the so-called New Testament documents, have nothing to do with this person of, of Jesus, and he's certainly not Jesus the Christ. There's really no greater conflict with faith than between a Jewish person and the figure of Jesus. We are taught from birth in some way that the one thing you can't believe in is Jesus. And so there are Jewish people who believe in uh, Eastern meditation, that's fine. There are Jewish people who are atheists, that's fine. Agnostic, that's fine. But if you believe in this Jewish rabbi, that's the, the big stumbling block. I mean, for that reason alone, there must be something very powerful about Jesus. which makes Kaduri's revelation, and this is the point I was getting to, makes it even more startling because watch, for Rabbi Kaduri to proclaim that the name of the Messiah is Jesus would be tantamount to, to Billy Graham or a Pope proclaiming, both of them kind of representing the Christian world, Protestant and, and, and Catholic Christian world. They that would be tantamount to, to one of those great figures of Christianity proclaiming that the real Messiah was Mahdi. When Jewish people look at Jesus, they're looking through a lens of 2,000 years of church history and a division between the church and the synagogue. So they, they, they see this man who generally doesn't look Jewish through stained glass windows um, in whose name they've been persecuted. Uh, in the name of the cross, they've been killed, the Crusades, the Inquisition. You have 2,000 years of, of what was not any, anything near real Christianity, but this is what they've seen. So for a Jewish person, it seems like you're being a traitor, you're going against everything Jewish. They don't see behind the veil or behind the, the stained glass window. Well, in the 1990s, and Kaduri would have been an elderly man then, uh, probably in his 90s, uh, there was another uh, rabbi who was uh, well known in, in Israel and among the Jews. He, be, he was good friends with uh, Rabbi Kaduri and he pronounced a prophecy over Kaduri when Kaduri was an elderly man that very similar to the one that was pronounced over him when he was 13 or 16 that he would see the Messiah before he died. So, as a matter of fact, then, in 2003, was the first time that Kaduri made a pronouncement that he had had the vision. Finally, he had had the vision, and he had seen the Messiah, and he had been given all sorts of revelation about this Messiah and information. And, and he spoke in rather nebulous terms there for several years. But in 2005, and this is what he is most famous for, uh, or, or, or some would say infamous, but in 2005, a lot of amazing things happened. In October 2005, Rabbi Kaduri, in his Yom Kippur service, the highest of holy days in, in, among the Jews, in his Yom Kippur service in his synagogue, he announced to the people that he had seen Messiah. Now, most of them had heard this, that he knew his name, he knew who he was, he knew the real identity of the Messiah. He also had some information as to the, uh, the coming of the Messiah. He could, he could associate it with a certain event. And he told the people that he had written the name of the real Messiah in a note, and that this note was to be sealed until his death. And then they were to wait one year after his death before they opened the note. July and August of that same year, Ariel Sharon was involved in the Gaza Land for Peace deal, highly controversial among many Jews and around the world. אז אפשר לא לאהוב לא, 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 את המילה, אבל מה שקורה זה תחת כיבוש. להחזיק שלושה וחצי מיליון פלסטינים תחת כיבוש, 
לפי דעתי זה דבר גרוע. זה לא יכול להימשך ללא סוף. אתם רוצים להישאר תמיד בג'נין, בשכם, ברמאללה, בבית לחם, תמיד. Uh, conservative evangelical Christians uh, do not believe that Israel should give up any land and, 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 and surprisingly conservative evangelical Christians are some of the largest supporters of Zionism this concept that Israel should be its own nation and have its own borders so when Ariel Sharon who's who was there before Israel was a nation he's fought and led as a general or a commander of a prime minister in every war that Israel's ever fought this nationalistic hero known as the lion of of Israel involved the nation of Israel and himself as the prime minister in this land giveaway of the Gaza Strip there was a group of uh, rabbis uh, who practice Kabbalah who pronounced a a death curse who, who performed a ritual it's an ancient uh, Kabbalistic ritual called the pulsa de Nura In Hebrew Aramaic it means uh, lashings of fire the study of the Kabbalah says that it's a it's a calling for the uh, the demonic or angelic forces to to affect one's life and to bring suffering upon a person until they finally die this group of uh, Kabbalistic rabbis pronounced this Kabbalistic death curse over Ariel Sharon in August of 2005. Now remember, this is August of 2005. October, just a few months later, Kaduri is in his synagogue saying, I've seen the Messiah, I've written it in a note. But the other astounding thing that he said was, and I must tell you that the Messiah will not come until after Ariel Sharon's death. Now, there's no evidence that I was able to uncover that Rabbi Kaduri was involved in the Pulsa uh, Dinura death curse. And, and he didn't even refer to that in his uh, synagogue speech, Yom Kippur. But it's interesting that this was done, and it was in the news that Sharon had had this curse pronounced over him. And he was not the only uh, Israeli leader in history to have this done to him. Within weeks, January, in the beginning of January, Ariel Sharon suffers a massive stroke and lapses into a coma. He has remained at Soroka University Medical Center in what everybody has described as a vegetative state since. But last week, when scientists showed Sharon pictures of his family, and they also had him listen to his son's voice, and they also employed tactile stimulation. They were touching him. They did all those things and tested him at the same time, and it showed his brain was processing the stimuli appropriately. Still, doctors then agreed that despite the comfort those results may offer to his family, he will almost certainly remain in the vegetative state forever. It's not like this is part of a recovery. To this day, at this filming, he is still in a coma. Some seven years later, Within weeks of Ariel Sharon lapsing into a coma, still in January, January 28th, Rabbi Kaduri is dead. After a short bout with pneumonia, he's hospitalized. And so when all of these events began to unfold in, uh, in, in a relatively short period of time, and then they remembered what Kaduri said and about his connection to Sharon and then that he had written this note. It was supposed to be read within a year after his death. And then now he's dead within weeks of saying that. So now the world waited with bated breath for that year to pass. And the year passed. And on Kaduri's website, somebody in his organization, his webmaster, somebody posted, and this is when Israel Today ran the story that became so famous, showing a picture of the note, interpreting the note, interpreting the interpretation that was given to the note, interviewing Rabbi Kaduri's elderly son, his son was in his 80s, David Kaduri, and discovering that the note, of course written in Hebrew, but I'll speak it in English, um, the, the note, and I'm going to paraphrase, but the note proclaimed that there was a that, that there was an encryption process to to knowing the name of the Messiah and in effect 
it, there was a there was a sentence, and and the instructions in the note were to take the first letter of each of the words of that sentence, and when the first letter of each of the words of that sentence were taken and put together, it did form a distinctive Hebrew word. And when the first letters of each of the words were taken, it spelled the name Yehoshua, or in another Hebrew way of saying it is Yeshua, uh, translated. So, speaking English now, this mysterious death note says the Messiah, his name is Jesus. And according to Kaduri's prophecy, Jesus will not come and set up his Messiahship until Ariel Sharon has passed. And from that point forward, when that note was revealed, and that was the purported revelation of Yitzhak Kaduri, that's when the religious world was thrown into a furor and a fervor. לא דיבר על יהושע ולא על ישו, אפילו לא הסגיר אותם. הרב לא מסר שום מכתב קודם פטירתו, לא הודיע לפתוח או לא לפתוח, שום מכתב לא היה משמו, וכל המכתב הזה כולו מזויף משלטו והצפו. אין שום אמת בדברים. Many began, began to proclaim this, is, this has to be a trick, this has to be a forgery. Uh, Rabbi Kaduri would never say such a thing. He would never betray his people like that. They, they saw it as an act of betrayal. כדי uh, להגדיל שקר, uh, לא מתביישים אנשי המיסיון uh, לומר שבנו של הרב כדורי, בנו הבכור של הרב כדורי, הלו הוא הרב דוד כדורי, מאשר את נכונות הסיפור לפיו הרב כדורי טוען, המנוח, שהמשיח התגלה אליו בשנת חייו האחרונה, וכרמז יותר מרמז, מיהו אותו משיח נקב בלא פחות ולא יותר מאשר בדמות המשוקצת ביותר בעולמה של יהדות, זו שלא בכדי אנחנו מכנים אותה על פי אותן ראשי תיבות ידועים, יימח שמו וזכרו. Why would a man with such great prominence politically and religiously, a man that could draw 300,000 people at his funeral, they had to close the streets of Jerusalem. Why would a man with that legacy, in, in the minds of the Jews, why would he ruin it all? I was close to the Lord. I didn't hear such a book. I didn't see such a book. And as we said, any person in Israel can see it and see it. It's not a person who can take it to a person. Any person in Israel can see that this book is a very dangerous book. זיוף, ולכן אין מה להעריך פה, דברים פשוטים וברורים, שהכל שקר וחזק. Rationalized that it has to be a fake, it has to be a forgery. Because why, why would he do that? He wouldn't do that. That was the conclusion they came to. They asked the question, why would he do it? The conclusion they came to was, he wouldn't have, he couldn't have. He didn't, is what they said. הצעד האחרון והכושל בדרך התחתים שנמשכת אלפיים שנה, מאז הופיעה הנצרות על במת ההיסטוריה, הדרך הזאת לאחרונה מנסה באופן, הייתי אומר, שקשה לתאר, שפל ממנו, לרתום את דמותו ואת זכרו של הרב כדורי, זכר צדיק וקדוש לברכה, ככלי לשתות, לרמות ולכזב Why would he ruin it for himself, for his family, for his children and his grandchildren? Forever and ever, the Kaduri name among many Jews was, was completely ruined by proclaiming that the Messiah's name was Jesus. Israel today 
claims in their reporting that they were able to examine the note and that David Kaduri tried to convince them that the note was not in Rabbi Kaduri's real handwriting because David brought them some other writings that he said was his father's real handwriting. You know, who knows what was real and what wasn't. But the note was posted on his website and went all over. I mean, people saw it, people downloaded it, and then Israel Today ran the article and did some interviews. I contacted the folks at Israel Today, and uh, they confirmed the story and, and declared and, uh, that they were sticking by their story, that this is what happened. Uh, the, the note was posted on the internet. They interviewed the son. Uh, um, uh, they interviewed some of the followers of Kaduri who confirmed this is the note. And David Kaduri, I'm not saying he had any nefarious reasons for this, but he had a ministry to continue. He had a life to continue. He had a legacy to continue. In some ways, as most ministries are, there's a business angle. He had a business to, to continue. And uh, this revelation could have proven to be devastating to all of that. So it would have caused him to be deeply concerned, even grieved, um, and, and then to, to try to unravel that. What do we do with this? How, how do we handle this? Is it real? If it is real, what do we say? What does that say about my father? If it's not real, what does that say about who pulled this dirty trick on us? So I, putting myself in his position, especially as a ministry leader myself, I, I can imagine uh, the, the angst that, that he felt. But the evidence is, uh, seems to suggest that, that, as a matter of fact, he did speak of the Messiah as being one called Yehoshua in his yeshiva. I studied in the yeshiva of Rabbi Kaduri, who also believed in Yeshua. Because Yeshua is the Messiah. Okay. Students of Rabbi Kaduri that no, don't have the full revelation. No Kaduri, we're going to have a group of Rabbi Kaduri students yatseg, uh, that will represent Yeshua as the head of the, as the head. In all the history and the people will get to know not only what Rabbi Kaduri taught but the full gospel. And there are organizations in, in Israel, in the country, that persecute Jews who believe in Yeshua, the Messiah. There's a lot of people that believe in Yeshua and are afraid to go public, afraid to, to, to say, but I'm not afraid. I'm only afraid of God. I want to say that a real Jew is a Jew who believes in Yeshua.